Okay, hello Sri Lanka, hello Grace School, Professor Brad here, and um, I yesterday, or a couple days ago, I covered the NRGY 101, sort of the basics of renewable energy, and now we're going to go into 102, which is more of the, the fundamentals, sort of bolts of renewable energy. So 101 also covered a lot of the physics that we need to know, it also covered a lot of the conventional fossil fuels. We looked at sustainability uh, from all the carbon fuels that we currently use. Now we're going to dive more into the renewables. So here we go. So this lecture I'm really going to look uh, at the uh, exam specifically. So what you're going to see here are a lot of questions. Pretty much uh, precisely what we're going to see on the uh, the second exam. So we're going to start off with something that is, it's not that easy, but oh well, your brains are fresh, so let's go ahead and, and get started on what's called the organic ranking cycle. So organic ranking cycle. And Here's the way I'd like you to start thinking about this. So probably right now you measure your energy in degrees Celsius. Uh, in the U.S. we typically measure temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. And the conversion, so uh, in degrees Celsius, absolute zero, or, uh, water freezes at uh, zero and water boils at 100. In degrees Fahrenheit, water freezes at 32, and it boils at 212. Uh, now, Rankine was another scientist uh, of the same time of Kelvin, and uh, Kelvins are to Celsius as Rankines are to Fahrenheit. So let's go ahead and look up the, um, the conversions here. So let's do a couple little conversions. Celsius to Kelvin, and there's some nice little conversions here. So Celsius and Kelvin is 273. Okay, so 273. And in rankings, let's see if we can do the rankings on that same guy. So let's go um, Kelvin. Okay, so if we go the other way, 0 Kelvin would be minus 273 Celsius. And let's go uh, Kelvin. Okay, so now we can see, um, we could also go Kelvin to ranking. So let's go 273. Okay, so 273 Kelvin is 491 ranking. 491, etc. So if we go back out, there's kind of some neat, um, neat images out here. Um, this is probably the the best one here. So boiling point, 212, ranking 671, Kelvin 373, 100, etc. So these are the four main temperature scales. And we can see that these two are more or less grouped. So Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit, which is F, Rankine, which is R, and Celsius and Kelvin are similar. So if we do um, the change of one degree Celsius equals the change of one Kelvin and also the change of one degree Fahrenheit equals the change of one degree Rankine. So you can see here um, in 
Kelvin Celsius and Kelvin to go from boiling to freezing is 100. Same thing, uh, it's a change of 100. Here to go from boiling to freezing, it's a change of 180 degrees. The same thing here, a change of 180 degrees. Okay, so it's just a it's just a shift. Now, the Rankine cycle. Let's go ahead and look that up. And let's just take a look at this guy. Okay, so what we see here on this scale is temperature. And what we say, see here on this scale is entropy. Uh, we also see heat going in and work going out. So what do we mean by that? Carnot cycle. Take a look at the Carnot cycle first of all. Okay, so this this figure right here is um, is very important if we actually want to do work. So let's first look at Carnot. Very important, and Carnot says that um, the change in heat equals the work. So the work equals the change in heat. So this is, would be in a normal heat engine. And an uh, example of a heat engine could be a, an internal combustion engine, like if you're burning petroleum in a car. Another um, heat engine could be a Stirling engine. We'll talk about that in a little bit. That's external heating. But in every single case, what we'll see in the car in the either the Rankine cycle or in the Carnot cycle is that we're always we're, we're we're always changing temperature, we're changing volume, and we're changing pressure. So in in every single case, we we are always dealing with the ideal gas law, which is PV equals N R T or more simply, uh, PV is proportional to temperature. So if the volume goes up, the temperature could, will increase. Actually, no, let's, well, let's not dig that, let's not dig quite that deep into it yet. Um, but what I'm, the point that I'm trying to make here is that if we are going to uh, do some work, if we're going to move something, uh, we need something that's hot and something that's cold, a change between the two. So to get back to the ranking, okay, to get back to the ranking, you can see that heat is going in. So we covered heat last time, so heat is going in. You can also see that heat is going out. So as heat goes in, the temperature goes up. Um, as that work is extracted, you can see that a turbine or something spinning is going out. And then finally, a, uh, a pump sends that back in. So we're sort of going around and around with each cycle. Now, if we're, if we're hot, equals Rankine. If we are colder, that's the uh, organic ranking. Okay, so I know that was a lot for the very first question, but the thing to keep in mind is that in order for any engine to work, you have to have hot on one side, cold on the other. That allows energy to flow and movement to happen. And if you have uh, a smaller change in temperature, then you cannot do quite as much work. So a bigger, a bigger change in temperature allows you to do more work. And that's why we see such high temperatures in coal-fired power plants and in high-performance engines. Okay, that was a lot to start with.
But let's go to the next one. Now, heat transfer, and we talked about heat transfer last time. So Q is uh, Q is thermal energy. Q is thermal energy. A is area. Delta T is temperature difference. Temperature difference. Difference. And U is thermal conductivity. So what we're trying to say here with this heat transfer equation is that Q equals U A delta T. What does this mean for us? Well, if we have a house, and we have a T in, and we have T out, then we know that delta T equals T out minus T in. Now, if the um, if T out, let's just say this is hot, and let's say this is cold. If T out is hot and T in is cold, we know that heat will flow in. Right? So if the if the temperature outside is greater than the temperature inside, heat will flow in. That's heat that the Q is heat flowing. Now all of this, the entire thing around the outside, this is the area. And so we know what heat is, we know what the area is, that's just how big it is, that's the size, and we know what delta T is. So what is U? Let's go look at U. Let's go look for thermal conductivity. Okay. Thermal conductivity. So if we come down here, what I like to do is just go and look at all of the different, look at all of the different materials. So I just uh, I made a little cor correction to the notes, and I, I used the improper term. So let's just go back for one quick second. Uh, I used the term thermal conductivity, and I wanted to use the term thermal transmittance. So U is actually thermal transmittance. There's another value called K, which equals the thermal conductivity. And let me get you the relationship between those two. Okay, so what I've done here, I've, I've uh, cleared this up. So U is the thermal transmittance. K is the thermal conductivity. So the dimensions of U are watts per meter squared per Kelvin. And note, that's a big big K for Kelvin, and that K, it's a little, little confusing, let's just go back up here, and note that that is, uh, 
this Kelvin right here, big Kelvin. Uh, little k, we can even make that sort of a bigger, bigger k for Kelvin. Little k, this is the thermal conductivity. And little k has units of watts per meter per Kelvin. And again, let's make that a big, big K for Kelvin. And we can now say that uh, U equals K times D. So the thermal transmittance equals the thermal conductivity times D. What's D? Well, D is um, this distance right here. It's the distance that the heat has to travel. Okay, so what we're looking at right now is a situation where we either want to make a house hotter or we want to make a house colder and or we might want to keep it the same temperature. So if we if we want the temperature to change quickly, so if we want um, if we want Q to go up, we can either make U bigger, we can change the thermal, we can change the thermal transmittance, this can go up, we can make the surface area larger, or we can have a, a bigger change in temperature. So there's three different ways to get more, uh, more heat into this place. So we can make the, we could change the thermal conductivity, and let's just go look at a few values for the thermal transmittance. So this is glass at 5 watts per square meter per Kelvin. If you have a roof that is very well insulated, this number is lower. This number is much lower. In general, this is a, a, a good thing. And you can see that typically the if we have the if we have a window. Window. This is going to have a relatively high U value, and heat will flow in much more quickly. Q is going to flow in much more quickly versus a well-insulated wall. Okay, and then finally, the next thing we want to look at is simply that U equals 1 over R or R equals 1 over U. And typically it's this R value that we see. And that's thermal resistance. Thermal resistance. So R equals thermal thermal resistance. Okay, so hopefully that clears up uh, the relationship between U and R, the thermal transmittance versus the thermal resistance. It's how easily heat can flow through a material. Okay, next slide. Now, uh, this next symbol, this is efficiency, and I'm going to bring up uh, Microsoft Word to show you what efficiency is. So let's make our font larger. So H equals uh, E out over E in. Make that small. Make that like that. Like that. Okay. So the eta, that's the Greek letter eta, and I'll write this out. So H equals efficiency. Uh, e equals energy. And one other thing we can do here. P. P equals power.
Okay, so what we're looking at here is the, is the equation for efficiency. And this is more or less the second law of thermodynamics. So let's go and take a look at that really quick. It's the second law of thermodynamics. And it says you can never get out more than what you get in. Let's take a look. Okay, well, there is a, there's a lot to say about the second law. And what we're, what we're looking at here is, is um, it, it says that it's whenever I put some kind of energy in, whether it's chemical, whether it's thermal, mechanical, I'm always going to lose a little bit. So let me give you, let me give you one pretty good example of a, uh, let's just say a car engine. So automobile. Let's see the car. It's the car. And the car is heading down the road with some velocity. There's some energy in, this is the energy in the uh, fuel. Now, to make the car go, we know that the energy in the car equals one-half mv squared, but we also know that a lot of the energy comes off as uh, heat, energy from heat, or, or, or Q in this case. So in this case, the uh, efficiency of the car is going to equal the energy out. That's what we're actually looking for. That's the one-half m v squared over the energy in. This is the energy um, in the fuel. And the energy in the fuel, if you remember, this would just be in the petroleum. So that's what we covered in the first lectures. In 101, we covered the energy in the fuel, and we know that a lot of it is going to go out to heat. And typically, this is going to be something like 0 0.25 equals 25 percent. And so the, in words, uh, less uh, comes out than goes in. Okay, there's always some loss. And you can write it either for energy or you can write it for power. You can think about energy as sort of the average and you can think of power as sort of the instantaneous. And we'll discuss that a little bit more. I'll, I'll show you a little graph um, showing what I mean, the instantaneous versus average. Okay, so that's efficiency. All right, now the next thing we're going to look at are um, high enthalpy versus low enthalpy systems. And let's look at that as well. Let's go out and just look at the definition of enthalpy. Enthalpy is also another name for energy. It's, it's more or less the it's more or less the uh, the heat of the system. So let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at that. Okay, so H is it's the heat it's the heat energy. Okay, enthalpy is heat energy. heat energy. I'm going to write it this way. Or thermal. Energy. So we could have two, two systems. One would be if we had a um, sink that's greater than 100 C and it was going through some cycle, let's just say around uh, 20 degrees C. This 
is going to be a high enthalpy, where you would actually have boiling water over here, versus a system that was less than 100 degrees C going in a cycle. And I just use, uh, I use 20 degrees C because that's uh, air temperature. And this is going to be a low. So in this case, you might make steam, uh, electricity, and over here is just more or less uh, heat transfer. So again, enthalpy is heat or thermal energy in a high enthalpy system. In a high enthalpy system, you're going to have uh, an operating temperature of greater than 100 degrees C. Going down to a lower temperature in a low, L-O-W, in a low enthalpy system, your operating temperature is going to be less than 100 degrees C or less than boiling and you're going to mainly use this for heat transfer. If you've got really high temperature, you can make steam and electricity. So that's the difference between high and low enthalpy systems. All right, so the next thing we want to cover is looking at passive solar. So in this case, this is again sort of low, low temperature. And what we're looking at is typically a house. And here's the sun. Here's the sun. Now, if we want to have a very efficient system, so let's say we want to keep the house temperature cold, what we want to have is a high R value. So if it's, um, if it's hot out here, and we want to keep it cool in here, then we need a high R value or a low U value. Same thing. So that's our first criteria. We also want to take advantage of a south facing. So let's say we actually wanted to make we wanted to make hot water. We want to point our hot water system towards the south. South pointing will get hotter. North pointing will be colder. So we want to point it towards the south, towards the sun. Yeah, oh, in one second, I got to look at the latitude of uh, Sri Lanka. One quick second. Okay, so what I, I just went out, and I, I see that Sri Lanka is actually just barely in the northern hemisphere, so seven degrees north almost on the equator. So what the, what I just said still applies. Anything in the northern hemisphere uh, applies to this. You're going to want to have the um, sun there in the uh, in the south. Well, the sun will be in the south if you're in the northern hemisphere. Okay. Now you're also going to want to have a large mass. So if we want to heat water, let's say we want to heat water We'll have H2O here, and we want to have a lot of it. So a lot of a lot of mass will allow us to store a lot of heat. A lot of mass, we can store a lot of heat. Maybe not at high a temperature, but a lot of heat. Okay. Now we also want a lot of circulation, so we might have a fan to keep the heat moving throughout the building. So this water could be hot, it could be cold, but in order to maintain a comfort level, we want to have good circulation of the heat. Now, we also want to have good controls. So the fan can go either on or off. Right, so that's the, that's the, um, the way that we can control how heat flows. So in order to have a good passive solar, have good passive solar, 
you need good insulation, so a high R value. You want to work with nature, so you're going to know which direction is south and how to manage sun coming in. You want to have a high mass, because this will make the temperature fluctuations small. This is with a large mass. If you had a smaller mass, the fluctuations would be much greater in temperature. This is your delta T, delta T. Uh, your circulation, you need to keep the heat moving. And you need to tell the heat when to go where you want it to go. So good control. Okay, so those are the five criteria for having a good passive solar house. All right. Next thing is our four different ways that we can use the sun. So solar PV, this is where we have a panel. The panel is going to look like this. Sun's radiation comes in and electricity comes off. Solar thermal, that's typically going to be a big black panel. Black panel, solar thermal. And in this case, we're going to have uh, heat coming off. Solar Stirling engine, these are kind of cool. Let's go and take a look at a solar Stirling engine really quick. So this actually might be kind of fun. This actually might be kind of fun. So in this case, um, the sun comes in, and it's a little little different. So we'll have some kind of um, we'll have some kind of dish. And again, heat comes in. This is the sun coming in. And so what we'll get is, uh, we'll get work, and then we'll get electricity. So this thing is actually an engine. So something is moving inside, a little piston is moving inside, and we'll talk about that later. Or you can just have daylighting. So in this case, you just have a house, and you have an open window, and you're looking just from uh, light will give you light and heat. And what this is doing, it reduces the amount of electricity. So if you use daylighting properly, you don't have to use the lights in the house. So you might have a light bulb here and you can, don't have to use the light bulb for daylighting. Okay. Now, for any basic solar thermal system, you have three main systems. One, two, three. The sun comes in. Here's the sun, and you have a tube, goes to the tank, this goes to the pump, and goes back up. So in this case, Here's the sun up here. This is uh, hot.
once it comes to the tank that it, uh, it'll be cold. Okay, so what I'm trying to show here is in any solar collector, um, the water inside the collector is hot, it moves to the tank, the pump um, then brings it, some kind of heat is taken off of the tank, you know, for a shower, for example, or cooking, and then it goes uh, back up to the collector to become hot again. Okay, so let's get back to it. We just covered uh, the basics of a solar thermal system. Now let's go on. Here's uh, another little look at efficiency. So again, this symbol here is eta, the Greek letter. Uh, we turned an H into an eta. That's efficiency. And this is, again, the Carnot efficiency. So the efficiency of a power plant is the high temperature minus the cold temperature over the high temperature. So if we have a thermal plant, we have Tc out here. This is the um, Tc, Tc, and this is just the atmosphere. So a thermal plant, this would be uh, coal. And inside is Th, 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 Th. And so of course, in into the plant comes um, some kind of typically chemical energy. So this would be coal, uh, gas, oil, etc. It could also be um, it could also be thermal. It also have thermal. So sun, uh, geothermal, etc. So if it's a thermal plant, the maximum, and this is the Carnot efficiency, and there are other subtleties to this, but um, in, a, in a thermal engine, the maximum um, efficiency is this. So if we had inside, let's just say Tc equals 300 Kelvin, and T hot equals, let's just say 600 Kelvin, then we know that the efficiency equals 600 Kelvin minus 300 Kelvin over 600 Kelvin equals 300 Kelvin over 600 Kelvin equals 1 half equals 0 0.5 equals 50 percent. That would be quite good, but in general, because of other factors, usually this is as, as uh, that's the best you can do. As there are other other losses as well. So this is the uh, uh, the, the maximum theoretical efficiency of a plant. And again, this is also energy in over energy out. And this stuff is all in. And then, of course, coming out is electricity. That's E out. Electricity. All right. Moving right along. Now, air mass ratio... This is important, and I think I've got another slide, so I'll, I'll get to this, but uh, important. For uh, solar PV output and input. 
probably more important for input because it tells you how much has come in. Uh, more on this later. Later. Woohoo. Okay. All right. Uh, this one has to do with seasonal variation. And so what I'm trying to show here in the middle, in the middle, this is the sun. This is the earth, nice and green, green, green earth. And what we're seeing is this is the month of June. So this is uh, northern summer or southern winter. Over here is January, which is northern winter or southern summer. Uh, March, this is the equinox. March 20 is the equinox. And over here, September 20 is the autumnal equinox. And all we're, all we're showing that in, in June, the northern hemisphere is getting a lot more sunlight. And in the, <clears throat> in the winter, it gets a lot, uh, a lot less, a lot less sunlight. So more sunlight here. In the winter, it gets less. And these two, in the spring and the fall, it's equal amounts. Okay, so that's very important, too, in terms of determining how much energy comes in at different times of the year. All right, so there's a question on the uh, exam about gallium. Gallium arsenide uh, PV cells, PV for photovoltaic cells, and let's um, let's take a look out here. I always like to go out to the dynamic periodic table for this one. All right, so let's take a look, and we know that most conventional, your typical solar cells are made with silicon. So here's silicon right here on the periodic table. It sits in a very special place. It actually sits right below carbon. Silicon is a semiconductor. And the way that we Wake up, wake up. Okay, so there's silicon, and the way we make silicon cells conductive, actually, let's just look at it this way. So I always like to go out to the orbitals. And so here's silicon, and we can see that um, silicon will have these two, three Ps with a single electron, so one two, three, four. There are four empty orbitals there. And so what we'll do, we'll either dope it with boron. So boron has that one extra electron to go in, or we'll dope it with phosphorus. And so depending on whether we're doping with boron or phosphorus, the silicon will become conductive. So there's another type of well, there are several other types of, of solar cells, but gallium, germanium, arsenic is another type. And so this will absorb sunlight at a different, um, at a different wavelength. So you can either have the gallium, germanium, arsenic cells or the boron, silicon, phosphorus 
So those are the uh, you know two most common conventional. But there are a few things that I would like you to look up because there's a question on the exam regarding uh, gallium arsenide cells. And we'll talk about that more later, so after you've taken the exam. Okay, this is one of my favorites. Um, I'd like you to pay attention here. This is very important. Uh, we've, already, we've already shown the power. This is the power equation. We did this earlier, and we know that this is power equals energy divided by time. And the way to look at this is, is like so. Actually, we think of time here, and we think of power here, and we think of our consumption, and all of this down here is, um, is energy. Right. Another way to write this is that um, is that energy equals the integral of power with respect to time. Uh, more on this later. That's the integral. We also know that power equals. We can think of the. Um, we can think of the power as the change in energy over the change in time. We'll look at that in a little more detail. So this one is the velocity equation. You could also just say the speed, speed equation. And here we know that uh, speed, so this is, um, this is speed, that's velocity. So speed equals distance over time. So if we think of it this way, similar graph, here's time. Sorry, can't do anything about it. Uh, here's speed, and this is how we think of this. So d, so the faster we go, the more distance we travel. So we can also think of distance equals the integral of speed with respect to time or the speed equals the change in distance over the change in time. Okay, a little bit more on that. So that's how uh, power, energy, and time are related in, as a good analogy with speed, distance, and time. Now, what, um, now we, we think that we want to move towards renewable energy, and um, not everything's perfect. A lot of times you might hear the phrase, pick your poison, you know, so there's always a downside to anything. So what are the risks of, what are the risks of PV? What are the risks of PV? Well, you've got to go and mine the stuff. You've got to dig the stuff up. And so a lot of times when you're uh, mining, there's a lot of waste. You're sort of disrupting water supplies. Uh, you're impacting habitat. There's also uh, risks when you are um, during manufacturing. So when these when these things are being built, they have to be built in a clean room. You do not want to get anywhere near arsenic, for example. Uh, that is um, very bad, very poison. So there are those risks during the manufacture. Once the cells are completed, all of that is enclosed. And there's no real risk for toxicity, loss of vegetation. So if you have um, if you have your solar, let's just say you had your plot of land and you had your um, vegetation, once you put your solar over the top, 
all this dies, right? So the any any plants that are underneath can no longer have photosynthesis, and so vegetation loss. Also, aesthetics. Some people don't like how solar farms look. Um, these are kind of nice. Those, those look, I think those look great. These look very clean. Some people would say, oh gosh, this is kind of uh, ugly. So um, make up your mind. When I, I was just in California, uh, this is maybe kind of, eh, maybe not so good. This is kind of cool. <laughs> this is kind of cool. So aesthetics is another thing. Some people just don't like how, how they look, and I think that's changing all the time. Shock. This would be uh, high voltage. And usually most systems... are going to be less than 600 volts. That's typically the target, is to keep them below 600 volts. You really don't want to touch anything uh, more than, um, you know, one, 100 volts is ouch. 100 volts, ouch. So that's another system. Animal habitat, if, you, um, if you're putting in the... Uh, the solar systems, you might have, um, you know, animals nearby, and they're not going to want to uh, be around. And there's also uh, recycling costs. So PV life is 20 to 30 years, and we have some waste So cost of removing waste, cost of waste um, remediation. So we have to do something with them, Recy recycle them, put them equals the integral of power with respect to time. So this is, um, this is energy under here. Another one is that power equals the change in energy over the change in time. What do I mean by that? Well, if I go from here to here, this is the, um, well, let's do it this way. Here's the change in time, and here is the change in energy. So as this moves, this is my this is my slope. I'm I'm looking at the steepness of that slope there, or if I look at one little spot right there, I have just e dot. So this would be e dot, and so the the dot is just the convention for meaning the the slope or the change with respect to time. We could look at uh, delta being a big change big change or the dot being a uh, small or continuous change. <clears throat> okay. So these are standard conditions. Four PV. Okay, so 25 degrees, 25 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> and if we have, let's just say, 10 degrees Celsius, then the efficiency goes up. If we have 70, well, not 75, let's not do it too crazy. Let's just say 50 degrees Celsius, the efficiency goes down. So it's better if the cells are colder. Very important to remember, if the cells get too hot, 
they become less efficient. If they're nice and cool, they become more efficient, just like any resistor in a, cir in a, seri in a circuit. Also, 1,000 watts per square meter. We talked about that before, so that's how much solar energy comes down per square meter. There's a couple different ways to measure that. One is kilowatt hours, which we know, kilowatt hours per square meter per year. This is per year. Or average, this is going to be average uh, kilowatt hours. And again, this is per square meter per day. So two different ways to measure how much energy you're getting, either kilowatt hours per square meter per year or average kilowatts per meter per day. Let's go and look at um, NREL sites. There we go. So I'm just going to show one example. So this is a PV, photovoltaic solar resource, and these numbers, they're very hard to see, but it's kilowatt hours per square meter per day, and it is um, uh, in California all the way up uh, 7, 7.5, uh, way up here, we're looking at, uh, gosh, only um, maybe four and a half or so. So those are uh, very important when you're planning your project to know how much uh, energy per unit area per unit time. That's, that's how to uh, measure those and think about that. And then the next thing is a 1.5 air mass ratio. So if the uh, sun is here and the earth is here and this is the atmosphere the air. If we go right here, this distance is air mass ratio 1, but if we go up here, you see this distance is a little longer, this might be air mass ratio 1.5. So air, AMR is air mass ratio. So in, um, I think in, in Sri Lanka, we can do this. So um, Sri Lanka, at around um, 1,200 hours. We're approximately 1.0 Sri Lanka at around, let's just say, um, 0700, maybe 1.5 Sri Lanka at around, let's see, minus 5, uh, let's go plus 5. Right? Yeah. 1,700 hours might be 1.5. So we can either have uh, this or this. 1.5. So air mass ratio means how much atmosphere that the sun has to go through. So if it's uh, coming in nice and straight, that's one. But if it's at an angle, like in the morning or at night, then it's it's longer because there's more there's more um, air to go through, and then when you get to the evening, it becomes basically infinity because there's there's none. It's also a function of latitude. So more north and more south, the air mass ratio also goes up typically. <clears throat> All right, here are the basic components of a solar panel. So this is your PV. It's your PV panel. And what's coming out of this is DC. 
direct current. So PV equals photovoltaic. DC equals direct current, current, this is Thomas Edison, his favorite, In INV equals inverter, and then AC equals alternating current. This is Tesla. So it comes in DC, goes through the inverter, and then it's AC. So DC from the DC straight from the panels, it goes through the inverter comes out as, and then we use it for useful energy. Electricity, of course. And usually coming out of here will be uh, 0 0.5 to 600 volts. That's what's coming out of here. And this is usually um, 110 to 220 volts. All right, moving right along. Okay, there's these things called the solar chimney. There's the uh, power tower. Let's just take a look at those. There's two, two kind of separate things. Love these images. This is cool. So the uh, the sunlight comes in, warms the air, and from here is electricity, and then it comes out. My idea. There's this neat place in, there's this neat place, this is in Montana, and I think we could turn this old stack into a solar chimney. Pretty cool. There's also a solar, this guy, a little bit different, so all around All around are mirrors and from this the sunlight goes in and electricity comes out so in, in both of these cases you have um, enough enough wind to drive turbines to make electricity or you have enough heat to make steam to make uh, electricity so a few different ways to go uh, from solar energy into electricity that it's not PV. It's different. It's not photovoltaic. It's, it's either uh, direct making wind or it's making steam to then make electricity through a generator. All right, so uh, thermal siphon versus a pumped solar thermal. Now, we already covered we already covered this before with the uh, components up here. If you remember, we did solar thermal. This is pumped. But if we go out, let's look at let's look at this. So this was uh, June eighth, two thousand twelve. This is one of my professors, Jonathan Bow. And let's just see what these guys um, let's just see what these guys did here. And got the system going, so you know, a little under two hours, it went from 60 degrees to 100. Um, it's 100 degrees right now. 
the water. Yeah. Nice. Anybody, anybody want to dip your finger in there, take a feel? You take a shower? <laughs> that was a hot tub. Yeah, almost. Now to show the, uh, this is going to take a few minutes, but to show the uh, the actual movement, we're going to we're going to put dye down at the bottom of this, and it'll run through our cold tube, and in about seven minutes, we should see the water here turn turn blue. Okay. This is the this is the return hot side. So with this tube coming down is our cold side. This tube right here is our hot side. So let's uh. Yeah, the dialogue. These are my students in Montana. So maybe uh, maybe you'll do something similar in, in Sri Lanka. They built their own thermal site. They also tried to build a Stirling engine, didn't quite get it. But it was, uh, so this is all with just convection, no pump. Explain, uh, explain again here, guys. What's um, what's what's driving the uh, driving the cycle? Yep. Hot's on top. Hot's on top. Cold on the bottom. Cold on the bottom. What's that? Kind of let everybody take the heat. Pull it up. Pull it down. Hot goes up. Cold goes down. And so yeah. Okay, so that was this guy right there. That was the video. Okay, a few other things to remember is this is primary energy from nature. Primary. This is going to be coal, gas, oil, geotherm, solar, nuclear, biomass, uh, wind, <laughs> wave, or even tidal. Secondary, this will be electricity. Heat. Uh, batteries. Hydrogen. Then delivered, this would be um, also electricity. Heat, light, and my favorite is information. Um, this last one I, I, I like a lot, um, information. So I'm going to show you one, one quick video. And I love these videos. If you get a chance, you, sh you should watch this. So. Um, These two. So BBC Order and Disorder. Let's look at this one. of heat engines and in the process begun a new branch of science but he would never see the impact his idea would have on the world in 1832 a cholera epidemic spread through Paris it was so severe it would kill almost 19,000 people now back then there was no real scientific understanding of how the disease spread so it must have been terrifying 
Carno, so this is a good one. Risks, decided to... And then there's this one. Nationwide is on your side. So many things you're doing with your life. Nationwide is on your side. This one's also very good. We are surrounded by order. Over the last 300 years, we've developed amazing new ways to harness energy. And we've used this ability to transform. So let's do this one. So the, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, what we typically get from energy, primary energy that we, that we value, and I'm hoping you're seeing the value in these lectures, is the, uh, the, the value of information. What I'm, what I'm attempting to do with my writing and my speaking and my, my pictographs is the delivery of in useful information that, that you can use uh, later as we move into the future of renewable energy. So that's why I say that um, information, even though it's not a type of energy, is um, typically what we, what we want or get out of uh, delivered energy, delivered energy turning into information being stored inside our, our minds, and then we can share that with others. Okay. Uh, there's another question on the solar spectrum, so let's take a look here. Solar spectrum, and this is just a shot showing um, all of the, the different wavelengths of light that come out of the sun. This is another solar spectrum that uh, shows some of the absorptions. So there's your, uh, there's your air mass again. And a lot of this is absorption of greenhouse gases trapping. And let's look at solar spectrum uh, for uh, silicon solar cells. Okay, so what I'm showing here is that um, this is the range where this is the range where silicon absorbs. So amorphous is is sort of uh, shorter wavelengths. Polycrystalline is a little bit longer. Monocrystalline longer yet. So that's something to consider: is that solar cells only absorb just a, a portion of the full electromagnetic spectrum because of the precise elements that comprise them. All right, and I've already, we've already mentioned the different types of energy. So tidal, um, this is from gravity. Geothermal, this is from uh, Earth's formation. and gravity, and nuclear, and then nuclear energy, this is from, um, basically this is from uh, supernova.
transformed our uh, solar system. Okay, so these are not solar. But all of these other ones, solar energy itself, so just pure photons coming in, that's obviously solar energy. Wind comes from solar energy becoming thermal. Uh, hydro, hydropower, that comes from evaporation and then rain. That's where we ultimately derive that. Biomass is also solar because it comes from photosynthesis and then waves because that comes from that comes from wind. So all of these are all solar. So the point is, is just to think about the ultimate source of these uh, different energies that we have for renewables. Um, coal, gas, and oil, you could also think of as solar, but ancient solar. There are chemi chemical energies that were stored, so very uh, ancient biomass. So this would be coal, um, gas, oil. These are all um, old biomass. Okay. Greenhouse gases, uh, you've probably heard a little bit about this. So carbon dioxide, this is carbon dioxide, this is methane. Methane. Um, sometimes they're called greenhouse gases or uh, GHGs. So we need greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases keep the earth warm, but too much becomes too, too warm. So um, that's one problem we have right now with... Um, so CH4 is uh, natural gas. So if we have CH4 plus O2, we get CO2 plus H2O. Um, when, when I was younger, the uh, CO2 was uh, 250. PPM, 1970, uh, 400 PPM, 2017. A lot of people think too high, too much. So let's let's take a look. So this is where we are. Okay, not 250, uh, three, 320. Okay, let me fix that. Let me fix that. Tools. Uh, let's say 320. So this is all from um, uh, combustion. And each one of these is summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter, as a function of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. Yeah. And most of this is driven by the um, vegetation in the northern hemisphere as the, the trees can pull the CO2 out and then burning puts it back. Uh, tracking solar. So if we have the, um, here's the earth and here's the sun.
There's 12. There's 0, 0600. There's uh, 1800. Tracking solar can in the morning and then at noon and then at night. So tracking solar can rotate. And let me show you a cool, really cool video. One second. I, I want to show you this one. I love it. It's beautiful. <laughs> Maybe expensive, but so during the day it goes, it follows the sun for maximum energy. And then at night, goes down for safety, for protection from wind, from storms okay so that's tracking solar one example uh, I think that's it okay so we I think we covered um, we covered everything for um, exam number two so good luck we've done exam one we've done exam two I want you to take exam two now and then uh, uh, John will grade it for you, and then I will come back and correct it. So after we've done, after we've done 101, we've done 102, then we'll put you into 243. Okay, good luck. See you next time.